I'm going to read an essay by Chase Davis called The Liturgy of Language. The Liturgy of Language. God speaks. He is not silent. He has designed humanity for reception of such communication and also to speak on his behalf. This speaking is not simply happenstance. It is not just a curious quirk about humanity. It is intrinsic to who we are that we speak and shape the world. Pastors, pastors in the pulpit, are at the helm of the course of history. When pastors lead liturgy, when songs are sung, when prayers are prayed, we are shaping people. The very tones, the syllabic emphasis, and pauses for breath shape not just our participating, but our own belief structures and habits of speech. We are not simply spectators in liturgy. Our very way of speaking becomes reflective of that which has shaped us. Like babies and children who adopt the same accents and parlance of their parents. Christians will share a common accent and parlance based on the word proclaimed, prayed, and sung. We begin to adopt biblical terms and phraseology to describe reality. We begin to speak with certain emphasis in certain places for certain words. Such is the power of language. It is designed to form a new people, a new kingdom. We are to be people familiar with our regal language and patterns of discourse. This language starts new relationships. It is the key to shaping society that the language we use conforms first to God's reality and then is communicated in an understandable way to the world. The liturgy of God's people shapes the way in which those very people subvert the liturgies of the nations of the world. This also explains how people attain power and influence. People gain power less through intelligence and more thorough social networks, relational and institutional credentialism, and a keen self-awareness and use of industry language. There are habits and language necessary for advancement and connection. This reflects God's design for us as liturgical beings. Our availability to navigate and articulate the language of various industries will determine our ability to participate in their own liturgies. An example, if you don't know what the difference is between a RFI and an ASI, well, it will be near impossible to get a job above carpenter for a commercial general contractor. Every industry requires you to know the right people and to use the right terms and phrases in order to be perceived as trustworthy. The current establishment in Christian institutions is no different. We would all like to think they are in power due to their wisdom and intelligence when in reality, it's often about social credentials and linguistic conformity. They have adopted certain liturgical phrases and intonations to build unity. This is why you're seeing a widespread abandonment and a denial of an association with words like critical race theory and woke. They are highly skilled at perceiving the popularity of different words and concepts. It's why those in power typically say much of the same thing with their own personal brands, of course, emphasized. It's why those in power typically say much of the same thing. They are following a particular liturgy. They are all watching and listening 
to see who says what so-and-so says, that they can also say something similar in order to be seen as a legitimate thinker. So while many are currently throwing shade and dismissal at being associated with critical race theory, they'll continue to launder the basic tenets of the ideology. Because the title of those ideologies are too much of a flashpoint, they will just deny the title while using the concepts within it. This is common to all people as liturgical beings. We follow the liturgies of others. It's not a conspiracy. We all adopt language based on perceived social advantage. But it is something to pay attention to when people seem to talk out of both sides of their mouth. People use language to connect with others, to rebuke, to train and exhort, like 2 Timothy 3.16 so proclaims. Language becomes a means of building families and churches, societies and institutions. But more than just a means, it is an intrinsic tool of liturgical formation. We are much more limited and dependent on the words of others than we might care to admit. We easily adopt the latest phrases, lingo, and shorthand of others. Again, this is by design. But thanks be to God, He has given us His Word, His liturgy, His church by which He intends to bridle our tongues to build His kingdom. We cannot deny that our discourse is captive to what we read and hear without denying a lit liturgical reality of God's world. To deny God's reality is to deny God. It would be better to own up to these frail impulses for power and connection, for influence and conformity, than to pretend like they do not exist. They more than exist. They build the world which is upheld by the power of his word. If you hang around a bunch of sailors, you're going to cuss and act just like a sailor. If you uh, contaminate your mind with these uh, country star musicians that uh, sing supposed Christian songs and talk about having one night stands and drinking beer, you're going to try to talk just like what you listen to. Young kids are going to try to wear their pants hanging down below their butt and talk like rappers if that's what you're always influenced about. If you're influenced and conformed to the Bible, God's Word, your speech is going to reflect that. It's going to reflect that. The fruit of what you read will come out of that mouth, you see. So I'll leave a link to this article in this guy's name, uh, Chase. Ah, embarrassing. Should have remembered that kind of a new fellow to me as far as reading goes, Chase Davis. He's a pastor. But I'll leave the link to this essay in the description. Till next time.